Hello, I'm Bernard Dan, Editor-in-Chief of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. I recently wrote an editorial entitled The End of Spasticity, with a question mark. Today I'm having a conversation with my friend Dr. Terence Sanger, Director of the Pediatric Movement Disorders Center at the University of South California and Coordinator of the NIH Task Force on this topic. Hi Terry, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. For a start, I'd like to know if you have your own definition of muscle tone. I don't think I particularly have a personal definition. I worked with a task force organized by the United States National Institutes of Health to look at tone and hypertonia. And so we basically define tone as the amount of resistance to passive movement. And then, of course, you would have hypertonia is when there's too much of that and hypotonia is when there's too little. If there is too much or too little, is then for the clinician to determine based on his or her experience? Yes, it's a clinical assessment. There are instrumented ways of trying to assess tone using robots, but the current standard is a trained clinician's impression. Is there a correlation or an equivalent to this passive approach to muscle tone when the person is active, whether holding a posture or moving? The child never complains of being stiff. Tone is not a complaint. Tone is a clinical sign that is tremendously useful for diagnosis and may be very able to pinpoint both the location and nature of an anatomic injury and may provide a guide to the types of therapies that may be helpful. But it's rarely by itself a complaint. And one of the points that you make in your editorial, which I completely agree, is that tone by itself is not impairing. The things that affect function are much more going to be weakness or the control of movement. Yet there is some critical control of basic muscle contraction when a person is active. Tone is modulated. Even when it's modulated incorrectly, it may be high or it may be low, and it may interfere with movement or interfere with interactions with the external world by being too high or too low. But the effect of tone on voluntary activity is very different than the tone that we measure when we push on somebody. Would you say that there is more of a continuum between passive and active tone in hypotonia and dystonia than with spasticity? Well, I would agree. I mean, there are different contributors, of course, to tone. We modulate tone at the same dexterity or the same level of precision as we modulate force and position. And that's the basis for understanding disorders of muscle tone. Many of these disorders, particularly a disorder like dystonia, which is one of the primary disorders of the modulation of tone, is when you get that wrong. So then you have excessive or inappropriate tone. Hypotonia, which often occurs in the context of cerebellar disease, is when you get it wrong in the other direction. You don't have enough tone to interact with the external world. How can we use this to improve our understanding and management of the patients? These are concepts from dynamics and from robotics and from control theory that are reasonably advanced and have not yet made it into the human motor control literature as much as one would like. Can we go back to the specific case of spasticity? Now, spasticity probably is not co-opting the normal tone mechanism. It's probably much lower level than that. It's certainly something that is present in isolated spinal cords. We see it in many different disorders which interrupt descending tracts either between the cortex and the brainstem or between the brainstem and the spinal cord or in many cases both. And in fact, even that is important to recognize that there's a difference between those. That's spasticity due to supravulbar involvement, effectively disinhibition of brainstem circuitry, is very different from the spasticity that is due to spinal cord injury, which essentially disconnects the brainstem from the spinal cord. The mechanism of spasticity probably has nothing to do with normal control. There are changes, as you know, in the excitability of the motor neuron pools in the spinal cord, and there's recent evidence that this may be associated with dysfunction of descending serotonergic pathways. How do you position it with respect to other motor disorders? Dystonia is not a compensation for something. It's an error. Ataxia is not a compensation. It's an error. Spasticity potentially could be an evolved compensation that allows for greater tolerance of premature birth while still allowing ambulation. It is not an accentuation of a normal phenomenon. It is a new phenomenon that supervenes in the context of injury but may be helpful, whereas something like dystonia is a phenomenon that is already there and is distorting a normal phenomenon, therefore for that reason is always likely to make things worse. Do I understand correctly that such compensation would be forced generation 
We should then make a distinction between global physical force and volitional force. You could be extremely stiff. Suppose that you have a joint which is so fixed in some position that the examiner cannot move it. And yet you can ask that person to generate force with that joint, and they can't do it because they can't move it at all. So that hypertonia can coexist with severe weakness. And strength is the ability to modulate force. It's the difference between the maximum force you can exert and the minimum force that you can exert. Just because your muscles are very active and are generating forces against each other doesn't mean that you have any useful control over those muscles. How can we be helped by technology to measure tone when the person is passive or actively moving? At the risk of sounding as if I'm giving up on that, why do we care quite so much about the precise quantification of tone? We care much more about the precise quantification of function. And you need to understand what are the components that are contributing to lack of function. I personally have moved away from trying to work quite so hard on the quantification of tone and have worked much more toward the distinction of different types of tone and trying to understand the relationship between tone and function. This is very helpful, Terry. Thank you.